On behalf of the Executive Committee, I would like to welcome you tonight and to thank you for your support over the years. <coughs> the Macedonian Society was founded in 1989 with the aim of promoting the Macedonian history and culture of Greece and is the main organization in the UK that informs and educates the public that Macedonia, its history and its heritage are Hellenic. The society is following very closely the recent developments in the Macedonian issue and the negotiations taking place between the two governments. As one of our main objectives is to educate the British public about the Hellenic heritage of Macedonia, we are planning future events to highlight that Macedonia has been an integral part of Greece throughout history. Uh, this evening we have the pleasure to host an event that advances the dialogue on the Brexit negotiations and its impact on EU citizens living in the UK. We are honoured to welcome Barrister Jolie Moore QC, Mrs Vicky Price, Professor Vasilis Monasteriotis and journalist Nikos, Nikos Kostandaras from Kathimerini newspaper. Unfortunately, Professor Jonathan Portes is abroad and unable to participate tonight, but his subject will be covered by Mrs Vicky Price. Uh, tonight's program and short biographies on the panelists are your, are your chairs. Uh, and the program tonight has introduction to the discussion by Vasilis Monasteriotis, panelist presentations, Dr. Monasteriotis comments and questions, question and answers, and closing summaries from Dr. Monasteriotis, and drinks reception afterwards. Uh, thank you very much, and welcome Dr. Monasteriotis. Thank you. 
Brexit, however, uh, has to do not with the perception of outside Europeanness or Britishness, uh, but actually with the, with the living conditions and opportunities of people, obviously, both in Europe and in, in, in Britain. And for what concerns perhaps this uh, gathering today, uh, uh, also for, for Greeks. And I think here we have uh, at least two uh, important dimensions. One dimension is economic, and I think a lot has been, a lot of uh, attention has been uh, given to the economic dimension. Will Britain be able to strike new trade uh, deals with the rest of the world that will be more beneficial, that will generate more jobs, growth, um, uh, regulatory issues? Uh, will Britain be? Uh, more independent uh, uh, to, to decide on different sets of regulations for trade standards, for employment standards, environmental standards, and so forth. Uh, and also, of course, will Europe be affected by the uh, departure of uh, the exit of Britain from the, the European Union? Will the European economy uh, uh, suffer from this? Uh, but I think more important, perhaps, is the geopolitical uh, dimension. Uh, there has been historically quite a few differences of opinion between the, I would call it the continent and, and, and Britain on uh, foreign policy issues, on big questions about whether the European Union needs to have a common defense policy and a common army. Uh, so there has been uh, many disagreements in the past. However, the, the, the participation of Britain in the European project and in the European Union as it became more and more uh, institutionalized and integrated. Uh, has strengthened the European Union. It has strengthened the European Union politically, geopolitically, in terms of trade negotiations, in terms of, in terms of prestige, even in terms, if you want to, uh, uh, with regard to uh, cultural diplomacy, or you know, the, the influence of arts and uh, um, uh, arts, uh, uh, theatre, and so forth, have uh, in, in on global uh, culture. So the the what we call soft power that the European Union may be able to accept after the exit of Britain may be somewhat compromised even though Britain was not the most uh, significant contributor to the soft power of the European Union while it was a member. So that may be a long, it may have been a long introduction. I hope I haven't bored you uh, too much. So I think there's wider economic and geopolitical issues that are obviously at stake. And the issues are not only uh, uh, questions of identity and belonging, but they also concern, uh, uh, they have consequences for individuals living here, living in Europe, and of course, as part of Europe, uh, living also in Greece. I think we will be able to touch upon some of these uh, dimensions, in part through the presentation to the panelists, but uh, perhaps more fully in the question and answer session that uh, will follow the presentations. I have to say, but. Uh, our first uh, uh, panelist, so more, will have to leave early with apologies. So we'll start uh, with this presentation. We will open up uh, for maybe two or three uh, questions. Uh, then uh, we'll have to uh, excuse him, uh, and then we'll continue with the other presentations. We can pick up the points, some of the points from the early discussion also of the last session of the of the Q&A. So without uh, do let me uh, say a few words for uh, our speakers, and I'll pass the floor. Uh, to them. So immediately to my left, so Mom, Mom uh, is a uh, litigation-based, uh, uh, so it has a predominantly litigation-based practice in the future of direct and indirect taxation. Uh, it has uh, expertise in litigating cases involving tax avoidance, employment tax, intangible property, and tax and judicial review. He's regularly invited to comment on tax issues by uh, quality broadsheets, magazines, and TV, including Financial Times, NBC, Tax Journal uh, and, and others. He has a, a LLB in the European Legal Studies in the University of uh, Dara and an MA in Modern Literature from Berger College uh, in London. Uh, he has served the Council Support and Diversity uh, Committee for a number of, uh, at the Bar Council Support and Diversity Committee for a number of years and he lectures the right value in tax policy matters. After Mom's uh, presentation of the sort of QA, we will pass the floor to the, uh, the second speaker, Nikos Kosadaras who I imagine many of you know well, is a columnist for the newspaper at and a contributing op-ed writer for the New York Times and the National Edition. He is the founding editor of Catmerini's English Edition, which is published as a supplement to the New York Times and the Societies, uh, and he edited it from 1998 to 
exit, which now seems increasingly uh, unlikely. Uh, uh, a Greek exit from the European, uh, from the Eurozone might mean, obviously, uh, for the country. So uh, our panelists will uh, take around 10 to 15 minutes for the contributions, and I'll start to look on the back for questions and answers afterwards. Uh, so without uh, do please join me in welcoming uh, our speakers in the room.
So, um, and there are various legal mechanics by which this might happen. There might be an association agreement, you might just extend the transitional period, but the machinery doesn't really matter because what is driving this is the politics, and what is driving the politics is that there is no majority for any vision of Brexit. So the world that I see is us being shuffled into this little um, anti-room, call it what you like, call it the transitional period, or implementation period, or call it an association period, it matters not, um, uh, whilst we get even more bored um, with fighting about Brexit. And so um, there's quite a lot of um, jockeying for position around what the terms of that transitional period um, should look like. And um, uh, I believe, at least, that the smarter analysts are focusing a lot of attention on getting that implementation period right. Not because they care especially about what happens in the two-year or the 18-month time frame of the transitional period, but because they are preparing for that transitional period to be the model um, for the future relationship for the medium term between the United Kingdom and the EU. Um, and so there's a new draft withdrawal agreement published by the EU today. And the most interesting bit in it, if you follow my analysis, is part four, which deals with the transition period. Um, with that very lengthy, um, those very lengthy preliminary marks, let me um, now come to address what all of that analysis means if you are you, if you are an EU citizen, a Greek citizen, living in the United Kingdom. What does it mean for you post-Brexit? Well, um, the good news is that um, the transition period basically preserves all by one, all by one, the rights that you presently enjoy in the United Kingdom. You continue to have access to the Court of Justice uh, to protect your rights, you continue to have uh, the right to live here and to move here. Your right, rights won't be restricted in any material respect by one. And that material respect is, is this. Um, you will lose your rights to vote in European parliamentary elections. Um, and this is gossip, it's amusing gossip, it's interesting gossip, but it is any gossip. And um, what I'm told is that it's the United Kingdom insisting on that. Of course, it will be reciprocated for uh, UK citizens living in, in the EU, and the United Kingdom is insisting on that because it fears that the um, European Parliament elections were going to be held whilst we were in the transitional period would turn into a proxy second referendum and uh, pro Europe MEP candidates will sweep the board and such democratic legitimacy as the Brexit conflict continues to possess will disappear. So um, what I hear, I say it's gossip, is that um, some mischief makers um, on the other side of the channel are pushing quite hard for um, voting rights to be retained in the transitional period uh, and they're being encouraged to do some do so by uh, mischief makers here. Um, so, endless transitional period from the perspective of a, an EU citizen living in the UK, um, that's all right actually. It's not profoundly different. Um, it means that the United Kingdom can cause less trouble um, when it comes to the development of the broader European project. And of course, um, uh, I don't need to tell uh, any Greek citizens that one of the problems with uh, the EU is that it is uh, neither, uh, it's either um, insufficiently, it's neither horse nor hand. It, it, it's either too integrated or not integrated enough. Um, and uh, if that project is to be progressed, uh, it might be quite a good idea stopped from um, sitting at the voting table for a period of time. Um, so that's my, that's my base case. Uh, um, things continue much as they are. Um, what happens if that theory is wrong? Um, I have a fallback. So um, one of the pieces of litigation I've been pursuing is a case that asserts that the UK citizens have the right under Article 20 to retain their EU citizenship post Brexit. So Article 20, which is the provision, I think, stemming from the Maastricht Treaty that creates um, EU citizenship, says that uh, EU citizenship 
interested in them. Now, um, of course, that's a great concern to me because I will lose my citizenship, my children will lose their citizenship, and that troubles me greatly. Um, why, does that, why is that an interest to you? Uh, the answer to that question, I think, is this. Um, one of the core guiding principles of, in the negotiations is the principle of reciprocity. In other words, um, everything that is given to or done to the citizens on one side of the negotiating table shall also be given to or done to citizens on the other side of the negotiating table. Now, um, European law cannot give you rights in the United Kingdom after Brexit. Um, 
is uh, by uh, the transitional period being bisected by a change of government. As I say, I don't, um, I don't believe that the Labour Party has any appetite um, for doing the, the dirty work, right, doing the cleaning up um, after this exercise, which is fun to an exercise of the Conservative Party. But should that come to pass, um, I'm told that the Labour Party has um, plans for dealing with um, the consequences of what might well be a far more radical program than is in this manifesto and those um, plans, uh, I'm told, uh, could include capital controls. So if it is going to deliver a very, very radical agenda, um, that, that, that has to be a possibility. Um, on the other hand, the Conservative Party remains in office. Um, I think it's complete and active. I don't think there's any possible to do that at all. But if you have a better sense of that than I do. Are there any questions from the floor? Something you'd like to pursue? Well, I can you wait for the microphone to come? Hello. Uh, I went last Monday on the Westminster Council. I'm a European citizen from Berlin. And they had a discussion, they all welcomed all our EU people and they're most welcome. Then I asked the question, as I have a European passport, I can vote in the local election, but I couldn't wait, vote for in or out. And I said so many other people couldn't do that. Now, sure, 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 that is political. We can't answer that. That was the uh, answer reply to that. Quite a later on when I spoke to Akin and other people, there were quite a few Romanians on the board in the council meeting. And a lot of questions have been asked, but unfortunately they are working on lots of things and they couldn't answer a lot of things. One thing that you say about the Home Office, how it was very, not very fair to European citizens, there was a very nice young man trying to have a British passport and twice he was refused. When we went up to the panel to find out why, well, mm -hmm, like that, couldn't answer either there. So it was a very, all the people from the EU were very disgruntled about the same. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, I think, um, I think, one of the things that's happening is that we haven't really taken this stuff sufficiently seriously. I'm not sure that is that. It's the other one. It's that one, sorry. Okay. Um, and one of the difficulties uh, that we have is that the Home Office is doing an awful lot that we don't know about. Um, it's not in the media. Uh, the government is delivering a political, um, a, a rather unattractive, um, and I personally think rather than without much political cost. Um, I very much hope that we will, oh, that's not my friend. Um, uh, I very, very much hope that we will be able to bring that issue to the top of the political agenda in the United Kingdom. Um, one of the things I'm doing at the moment is I'm trying to get together a fighting fund to bring a series of high profile um, cases challenging Home Office immigration decisions in relation to those who are not UK citizens. Not because I'm um, strategically interested in results of those individual cases, but because I think it's a very, very good way to push the political, uh, push the issue up the political agenda to increase the political cost for the government of behaving in the way in which it does. Yes. Uh, you presented the current situation as a split. Conservative Party, uh, but would you not agree that it is also to some extent uh, a split in the Labour Party um, with at least two MPs, Frank and Kate Hooley, uh, being uh, exiteers, uh, and also a split um, with Labour um, Party voters, especially in the north of England. Um, and therefore, it's a bit of a split, um, would you not say, between people in the country, England, especially outside the metropolitan centres, 
um, and members of parliament. Right not to be 
like some people have been doing. They want to change, but they didn't want that much change. And this prompted him to perform that great uh, and embarrassing reversal for Kolotumba, as they say in English. <laughs> By 1990, some 75% of Greeks thought that being part of the European Union was a good thing, with only 8% against it. Remember that in, in 81, 27% thought it was a good thing. A few years later, 75% thought it was a good thing. And then in uh, 2004, when Greece was at its apogee, when we had the Olympic Games in Athens and they went well, when Greece won the European soccer title, which was even more exciting, uh, with membership of the Eurozone, 82% uh, thought European Union membership was a good thing. This is the high point. Uh, when the crisis hit, these figures dived. With 58% uh, of Greeks in 2010, when they realized we were in crisis, expressing negative thoughts about the EU. And yet, even then, they placed their hopes in the Union. When asked who did they think uh, would uh, help them get through the crisis, 37% said, said the EU was the best uh, assistance, followed by 17% who had faith in the Greek government, more than it deserved, 10% in the G20, I don't know what they were imagining, 7% in the IMF, and 4% in the United States. <laughs> I, they were not asked about Russia. Ah. Also worth noting are some findings by Greece's public issue company, which we can say is a company that is not Eurostat, the way the Eurobarometer is. Um, so in May 2016, just before the Brexit referendum, where 55% of Greeks polled said they hoped that Britain would stay in the European Union, negative attitudes towards the EU in Greece were at 55%. But the Euro was supported by 54% of those polled. So a majority didn't want the EU, but a majority wanted the Euro. By February 2017, support for the EU had risen to 52%, again, showing a rise in confidence. I hope I haven't tired you with these figures, but what I wanted to show you was how the attitudes play according to, to, to the confidence uh, in, 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 in the state itself and in the relationship with the EU. And. Um, we can see that the relationship between Greece and the EU has been a roller, co roller coaster ride. Even when faith in the European Union has been low, most Greeks have wanted to remain in it. And it's interesting here to add a figure from the last Eurobarometer, the one that came out in December, um, where 75% of all European Union member state citizens have a positive view of the EU. That's a, the average across the Union. Greece, with 58%, it's still positive, is right at the bottom. And the United Kingdom, 
is just above Greece with 59%. So we're fanatically uh, clinging to membership, and Britain, which has even greater confidence in the EU, according to the poll, uh, is uh, split over what, what, they, what will happen. So with such similar percentages, the Greeks want to remain, as I said. And this is what made uh, Tsipras, uh, the prime minister, reverse himself and correct the popular vote when he had it tangibly in his hands. And uh, this went far beyond economics, and this is what I, I want to, to, to leave you with in, as I come towards the end. It's far more than economics for Greece. Membership of the European Union has been the fundamental achievement in the post-World War II years. Aside from the trauma of the ongoing crisis and the tensions that this has created between the Greeks themselves and between Greeks and some of their fellow Europeans in the way that the whole issue was, uh, was framed from the beginning, it, it is clear that the European Union has benefited the Greeks enormously, not only through the, the, the billions in farm subsidies uh, or the major infrastructure projects, or, but it's been a huge leap in the quality of life in expectations of the citizens in something better and actually an improvement in government. We know that things are far from perfect, and if we look at developments today, I mean, th 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 things are not adequate in, in terms of public administration and civil discourse. But the EU has imposed rules of civil behavior and demanded the rule of law to an extent that was not there. It has safeguarded democracy after a history of division and military intervention, and this has been very clear in Greece. Um, just look at our neighbors. Um, and um, th this has been an unprecedented period of, of, of stability and prosperity through the European Union framework. And the euro, for all its problems, and it has been a problem, uh, put an end to perennial currency instability. Um, th uh, the historian George Dettelis is latest, and he says his last book, I think he's had enough of this, uh, has the very apt title, Seven Wars, Four Civil Wars, Seven Bankruptcies, 1821-2016. I don't think he wants to go to the next wars and the next bankruptcy, so he's putting an end to it. The consensus is that it's not the European Union that is to blame for Greece's ills, however tempting it is for us to blame the Xeni always. The EU has been a positive factor in our lives, and it's difficult to believe any Greek arguing that, it, that we'd be better off without it. And much of this positive balance can be traced back to the very British values that have come to Greece, not through a century and a half of efforts by the so-called English party in Greece, as opposed to the French and Russian ones, but through the European Union. These are the need for reform, for the rule of law, for an efficient banking sector, and so on. Liberal democracy, the Enlightenment, they gained a foothold in Greece in this way. And though the battle between the forces of division doesn't end, and at times it seems vain to, to hope for it, um, the European Union has offered protection at many levels and also made us stronger. In Britain, by definition, those who want Brexit believe that EU membership weakens Britain. What lifts Greece, they see as a burden to their country. I will not get into the arguments for and against Brexit. I'm sure you have enough of them uh, already. Uh, but what I believe is that the losing Britain will be a fundamental loss to the European Union and to all its members at a time when the Union needs a combination of vision and pragmatism to meet its current challenges. And the British could always be counted on for pragmatism um, and on the need to make things work. And it is this need that will strengthen the bond between Greece and Britain after Brexit or Grexit or both or whatever form they take. Greece may no longer have to depend on Britain as a military ally as it did right from its independence, as, as, as a friend in, uh, that it needed to survive uh, and right up until the last civil war. But the two countries share much and they have to defend their ties in education, in culture, in the arts, in tourism, in shipping, in trade, in defense, in health, everything that is there. In all sectors already, thankfully, there are people and agencies on both sides working on new opportunities, strengthening these ties every day. Um, there is the potential for a special relationship, and I don't want to take away your um, friendship with the um, rapidly disappearing United States, but we can have our own special relationship, uh, where both countries will benefit by providing opportunities to their citizens to move around freely, whether working or retired, uh, European Union, um, whether working or retired, and this is one of the things I'm thinking of, is that uh, Greece has a very uh, rapidly aging population. Britain has, um, we'll talk about that, many opportunities to expand into that. Um, 
So the European Union membership, when it came to Greece, brought a new equality between Greece and the United Kingdom, which was not there before, and it facilitated relations at all levels, and those levels have grown stronger within the European Union, and they can continue to grow stronger, because although we're very different countries and with very different perceptions of ourselves and, and each other, uh, and our history is different but intersects very often, as you know, uh, we do know each other in a very, very almost intimate way, I think, more than other countries uh, share. Um, I think from ancient Greece uh, to Hercule Poirot, I mean, Agatha Christie is um, always a hit in, <laughs> in Greece. And I think that as long as there are people of goodwill and understanding on both sides, and there are many, Greece and Britain will continue to build on their shared past. And um, if I may have a minute, because yes, I had yes. some thoughts when I was reading this uh, on the plane, and then the best part came to me. <laughs> uh, is that the, what the Greeks can learn from the, uh, from the British. One, one of the finest minds of, the, of Greece of the last century was Yorgos Tsotokas, an um, intellectual writer. And uh, he, although he'd been educated in the French uh, way, he, he said that Britain had reached a superior model of political freedom. Um, and he hoped that the alliance between Greece and the UK would facilitate the transmission of this model to Greece, something that had not been done in the previous uh, hundred and so years. Um, he worried that the Cyprus issue would tear the two countries apart, and uh, we know what happened. Um, but at these he named as the absolute respect for the principles of liberty and the rule of law, the love of tradition, freedom from dogma, the ability to adapt socially, economically, and politically, avoiding violence and dictatorship, and I'd like to add, we, we'd also like to learn civilized behavior in, in, in soccer stadiums. I mean, I compare West Ham's uh, almost ritual pitch invasion on Saturday with our uh, armed intervention on Sunday, uh, which you're all aware of. Um, uh, we could also learn about the assimilation of immig immigrants and multiculturalism to the extent that it has been a success, plus its problems. We'd like to know how to control oligarchs to the extent that they are controllable. We should learn to manage our own real estate rather than buying in Britain all the time. I learned the tricks about that. Um, we should become more pragmatic in exploiting opportunities and uh, facing challenges. Uh, we need to be extrovert in education. And I don't mean just the very sore point of the Greeks uh, not having uh, non-state universities, but when I... I've, I've thought of uh, Cambridge and Oxford and how they started out uh, with monks, and I, I've also thought of Athos as it started out with monks and the different directions that they took, each valid, but uh, each playing a different role. Um, and I think that um, the, the Greeks and the Britons have many opportunities to look at, whether they remain in the, in the European Union or not. Um, and I come back to this, without the one being a hegemonic power and the other a dependent state, and I think that that is the good foundation for the future. Uh, and I'd like to say what I would like to see the British not learning from the Greeks, and that is arbitrary behavior and uh, haphazard rule of law, confrontational politics and division, nationalism and nativism, giving free reign to the rich and impunity to um, small uh, vocal groups, um, having exorbitant taxes without the corresponding services, having a public administration whose main aim is to preserve uh, itself as it is, uh, and of course, don't have a highly partisan news media. And as I mentioned all of these things, I was thinking of the last few months, a couple, couple of years, how the situation in Britain has been changing, and I'd like my last word on this to be look at Greece and its problems and <laughs> try to avoid them. <laughs> Thank you. Nico, thank you. We'll move directly to Vicky. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for this. Uh, however, I think we do indeed have a partisan press right now in the UK. <laughs> uh, and it's interesting talking, thinking about Greece, which I didn't quite uh, uh, expect your contribution to be uh, uh, quite so moving, actually, about the Greeks. Uh, unfortunately, Greece and its problems was, uh, was used uh, in the referendum campaign um, in a very negative way. So it was, look what Europe has done to Greece. Why do you want to look at the mistakes they have made? Look how they've 
you know, turn this country into, into a disaster area with such huge loss of GDP. Um, and so why do we want to be part of this failed region, which is declining anyway in terms of its importance to the world? And, and that sort of uh, feeling took hold. Uh, so Greece actually plays quite a big role in this, which is rather worrying. Uh, and the other thing is that it's, it's interesting what you said about nationalism. Before the Eastern European countries joined, uh, certainly on any map of Europe, you'd see that the most uh, nationalistic, two most nationalistic countries uh, in Europe were Britain and Greece. Of course, both sort of at the edge of Europe, uh, but actually sharing that mm -hmm. uh, between them. So, um, uh, and thinking about immigration and the issue that we're talking about uh, today, which is uh, how you treat migrant labor. Um, uh, if you were to ask the Brits uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, a question about do they want to see less, less immigration, uh, they would, and you had a referendum, they would all say overwhelmingly yes. Uh, so uh, the, the, the mood had always been like this, you know, uh, some more small changes depending on, on the period. Um, but generally, uh, there is a concern, has been a concern that perhaps too many people have come here or come here at any time. Uh, and uh, the last expression was against the, the Europeans because that was the thing that they were allowed to vote on. Uh, but actually, I think it hides underneath that a much greater concern, not so much about the, the Europeans, but about the wider uh, range of people who come over. And I think the question about what do you do with all those communities in the future is very, very important too. So, so it, it, is, it is an issue which I think perhaps explains a little bit of what's been going on uh, in terms of the responses of particularly the Conservative Party, but not exclusively the Conservative Party, uh, to uh, the numbers that have come in from uh, Europe, particularly, of course, Eastern Europe, uh, when we opened up our borders much earlier than anyone else in 2004. Um, and we ended up in this position where, of course, the Greeks are equally affected, uh, when, you know, as numbers, we're not particularly large, uh, although probably larger than, than, than we think. Uh, and it's quite interesting talking to various embassies. Uh, you know, we look at, at what the official figures tell you, uh, in terms of the numbers that are here per nationality, uh, and they tell you that actually the figures are probably twice as large, if not more. I don't know where they are, because of course we don't have no idea who's here. Uh, we don't register anyone. So, so it, it is an issue in terms of how we cope with any changes that may happen uh, in the future. So I think it's worth uh, just thinking about migration in, in a minute for a while, uh, before we go down to what's been proposed at present, because uh, of course, we, we uh, uh, think that migration, or rather the, the campaign was that migration is bad for the economy, whereas in fact, uh, we know from all the studies that have been done, the Office of Budget Responsibility, uh, for example, uh, showing that migration is actually very good for the economy. It increases productivity. We've just had some uh, figures from uh, the Chancellor uh, in his spring statement that show that actually productivity is not doing very well and it's likely to stay very low in the next few years, which also then means low growth in the economy. Well, less migration means less productivity, means less uh, ability to uh, manage one's debt. It means higher deficit to GDP ratio, it means higher uh, debt to GDP ratio. Now why? Not only the productivity element, of course, which is innovative people coming into the, into the economy, you have a wider range of people to choose from, uh, you don't stop your production because you have problems in terms of labor, you can hire whoever you want, that's very good for businesses, they can expand and so on, and lots of very innovative, clever, skilled people come in uh, and contribute to startups, to the city, and everything else, to science, in universities, I mean, that's, that goes uh, without saying. But also, very crucially, uh, migrants contribute positively to the finances of the UK's economy, in the sense that they are the only group in the country that makes a positive contribution uh, to the exchequer, in the sense that they give in, in terms of taxes, more than they take out. Whereas the rest of the economy basically takes more in terms of payments from the state than it actually contributes in revenues. So you reduce that to anywhere below 200,000 net a year, and you have a real problem uh, on your hands. 
And what is going on right now, of course, is that migration is being reduced. I mean, the latest figures suggest that particularly EU migrants, um, their numbers have been reduced very significantly uh, to the point where you begin to wonder whether you are going to reach this 200,000, which 200,000 is all in EU and non-EU. And remember, uh, the latest figures for the last year suggest that actually there were more non-EU migrants who came in where we have complete control, and yet we let them all in, uh, than EU migrants who came in. So already the, the, there is a shift, uh, people uh, not being very willing to come in here. Uh, there are skill shortages developing in lots of areas, not just high skilled but also low skilled ones. We know that uh, nurses' uh, willingness to even consider a job here, you know, uh, the, the National Health Service has been going and recruiting uh, from abroad, particularly Eastern Europe, but the interest of nurses uh, to, they have to sort of tick a little thing and say, yes, I'm interested, I might want to apply. That's, got, that's dropped by 94% in the last year. I mean, that is huge. Uh, so we're already beginning to wonder how some of those posts uh, are, going to be, are going to be filled. Um, so so, so it, it is an issue, uh, you know, looking ahead, how, how the system here will cope uh, with, uh, with all this. And, all, and, and the idea that by having controls, border controls and immigration controls, uh, will mean that we keep uh, the, non, the low skilled people out and, and therefore uh, wages will rise in, in, in the UK. I mean, the reality is that only one in four uh, migrants who come into the UK from the EU are low skilled, or at least work in low skilled areas. And the truth is that as a result of migrants coming in, the skill level in loads of sectors in the economy has gone up because a, no a number of them have all sorts of qualifications and yet they may become Uber drivers, although they may have an engineering degree or they work in shops where they can actually help adapt the systems in a way that actually pushes productivity of, of particular uh, areas up. Uh, and, and the other thing is that you can't necessarily control uh, who wants to come in. It depends on how your economy is doing, uh, they may want to go somewhere else. I mean, after all, uh, Europe, that we thought was a failed uh, region, is in fact growing at the fastest rate in 12 years. And the reason why we're doing reasonably well economically, at least, uh, you know, perhaps 1.5% isn't reasonably well, but, uh, but at least we are surviving uh, with quite high employment, is because Europe is, is booming. Uh, so, I mean, for, for, uh, uh, for the UK, this has been very beneficial, but it also means that people who might come to us or might have come to us before may decide, actually, this doesn't really uh, look particularly uh, attractive any longer. Uh, so they may decide to go somewhere else, and that is already happening. Plus, of course, the exchange rate, uh, because of Brexit, of course, uh, we may not be doing that badly right now against the dollar, but that's more a Trump issue. Uh, if you look against the euro, we are still as low as we were after uh, the referendum, the, the shock uh, devaluation <coughs> that, uh, that took place uh, at the time. So, so, I mean, all these issues uh, suggest that, that the there needs to be a serious rethink of how this migration policy works. Uh, and, in fact, the, the, there almost has been. It's quite interesting that... Uh, the government has asked the Migration Advisory Committee to look at the economics of migration, as if we haven't done it 1,500 <laughs> times already. Uh, and they are not going to report until the autumn. Um, now, the autumn, now think of the autumn. This is uh, near the, the October date, uh, which is when really we should have decided what we're doing, certainly with the transition period and have a withdrawal agreement that needs somehow or other to tell you what we're going to be doing beyond the transition period. Now, of course, Joe, who was here before, is keeping his fingers crossed the transition period will, will last forever. Uh, well, uh, fine, I mean, that would be really great. Uh, now, of course, the Europeans have said today, or, that, or rather, they, they had said already, and we today said, yes, we accept that, that actually transition period will finish by um, at the end of 2020, so even less than two years. Now, as Joe was saying, uh, anything could happen. We could have another election at some point. The, 
there could be a real problem with a withdrawal bill, with a trade bill, all those bills that I mentioned, the migration bill, all those things which haven't quite come back yet uh, are being very, very slowly g going through the process of Parliament and the Lords, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, uh, and they could be thrown out at any point. And there are loads more amendments now being put to allow for greater consideration over this. So there is a lot of uncertainty uh, at present in terms of what or where uh, we, might, uh, we might end up. Uh, nevertheless, there is a legal, a sort of legal framework that is being developed because, uh, you remember, there was an agreement on, in December 2017, uh, and, and that agreement uh, said, between the EU and the UK, uh, that uh, those people, all the Greeks, of course, were here, who've exercised their free movement rights before the Brexit date, remember the Brexit date being uh, uh, March 29, uh, 2019. Of course, there could be an extension of Article 50, which is the official letter we've sent to say we want, we, you know, which allows for two years uh, for us exiting. Um, there could be an extension of that. That's another thing which, surprisingly, Joe didn't mention, but lots of other people are talking about that. But let's put that aside. Um, otherwise, if it were to happen, so all those who've exercised their, their, their uh, uh, free movement rights before Brexit Day and wish to continue to stay in this country, of course, um, they will have the right uh, to apply for settled status. I mean, they don't necessarily have to be here. They have to have been here. And they can apply for a settled status, uh, which, of course, needs to be defined a little bit more. And we are discussing that earlier uh, with the embassy in terms of what it actually means. So what it means broadly is that their existing rights will be preserved uh, or broadly reserved, which will include access to things like health care, other benefits, etc. So they'll be like a UK uh, citizen. Um, but it doesn't mean that all rights uh, are going to be preserved. In, in particular, um, it is the, there is an issue of whether uh, people uh, who are already resident here um, will in the future have the right to bring in spouses without any concern or any other family members. So that could be restricted and that's something that, that is being negotiated, will have to be negotiated before the withdrawal agreement is, is, is put to bed. But uh, it will incorporate these provisions in legal form. So we already are moving towards getting to a point where uh, that will happen and will be written into our national law. And that's how things are moving. And there will be enforcement uh, through our national uh, courts here uh, but in practice, I think the, the general belief is that uh, we are still going to be um, paying attention and follow the jurisprudence of the, of the European Court of Justice. So there is an agreement that this will happen. And you remember, we have this eight-year period during which the European Court of Justice will still be able to say uh, or to act on behalf of EU citizens here if they feel that their rights haven't been uh, properly uh, um, fulfilled. Uh, now, is it going to be eight years? as the agreement said in December, it could be longer. Uh, we could have a different government. As we, I mean, this is a negotiable one, even though it could be written down as something that needs to be followed, but it could, uh, it could actually uh, uh, change. Uh, and uh, in a settled status, of course, is quite an interesting one. We, do, we don't quite know exactly how it will apply, but the government here has said it will try to apply it in a simple way. It will be affordable. It will be quite cheap for people to apply for it. It won't be as complicated as, as now. So anyone who had applied for citizenship before, just forget it and for, may have all to reapply again, of course, but it's going to be simple, supposedly. It won't require these tons of documentation that we had before, um, and so on. So at least there's some movement to, to uh, uh, put in, in some sort of legal form what will be happening post-Brexit. Um, but actually, it isn't really settled uh, because there's quite a lot of, of uh, concerns that one may have because, of course, in anything to do with immigration law, the devil is in the detail. Anyone who's been involved in, in this will tell you, and Joe would have told you this if he was here. Um, so everything will need to be translated into a legal text. Uh, and there are a number of things I already touched on. The family rights, for example. Um, so they need to be specified in the withdrawal, in withdrawal agreement uh, so that... So that the UK can't deny those rights uh, for people. I mean, so far, um, unfortunately, if you look at non-EU, the UK's record is dreadful in this. 
so that's, that's something that, that needs to, uh, to be looked at and should allow as much flexibility as possible so that can also be contested. Uh, then what the administrative procedures are for getting uh, settled status, uh, you know, it's so that the commitments of the UK that themselves are meaningful and enforceable. Um, so, and then of course, um, uh, the independent national authority which will monitor the implementation of the agreement. Now, how is it going to be run? Uh, that's a, is it going to be generally independent? So all these things need to be, to be uh, sorted out. Uh, and then there's the whole issue of, of, of sickness, comprehensive sickness insurance. I mean, I, 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 uh, my niece uh, was looking, has been here for years studying and, and working. Uh, and then we realized that certainly as things were, because she didn't have comprehensive uh, private uh, ins health insurance, she, all her years here didn't qualify her for citizen status, which is quite odd. I think that has now supposedly been thrown out. If you look at, at what uh, was discussed in December, the UK government has made a commitment that this requirement will be waived, uh, but it isn't yet in the withdrawal agreement itself. So another thing that needs to, to be watched. Well, that's for the longer term. Now, just quickly on the transition period, uh, which is a really important one. I mean, we begged for it. Um, because basically we're not ready uh, at all. I don't think anyone, frankly, had any idea how difficult the whole thing would be uh, when they were uh, suggesting to people that, yes, it will be brilliant uh, when we leave and we'll take back control immediately. We're not taking back control. We're basically uh, giving all the control to the EU. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not a particularly pleasant position uh, to be in. Um, but the... But the, the uh, what, what the government has, has said, nevertheless, is that free movement will end after Brexit. So transition period, nevertheless, means even though free movement will end after Brexit, Brexit 2019, of course, is not ending at all. Uh, the existing frameworks of rules and regulations, I'm quoting this now because this comes from the, from the statement, will apply during any transition period. Um, so, so uh, and if you look, I mean, we've talked about the acquis uh, when Joe was here. The position of the Commission and the European Parliament is that the full application of the acquis must be enforced during any transition period. So ECJ and everything else, all that uh, uh, is there. So, so the question is, you know, how do you reconcile the two uh, positions? Well, I mean, we obviously, obviously have accepted that it will operate as is now. So that's good news for any uh, Greek uh, who is here. But the question still is, are there going to be different rules for anyone who comes after Brexit Day? Not very clear. Now, we heard Theresa May say at one point recently that actually, yes, it will. The transition, it will be exactly the same. Uh, they have the same rights when they come. And it's one of the points that the Commission is going to insist on. Good news if they win, because I think that makes a huge amount of sense. Otherwise, you end up with this incredible thing. I mean, just, just imagine what you do uh, with all the European citizens afterwards. I mean, the truth is that right now there is control, if you like, you know, in the sense that uh, everyone goes through a passport control when they come in. So, it, and, and you can register people if you want to. But let's assume that people register after uh, Brexit date. So you have the people who registered and people who haven't registered. Then you have people who get settled status and people who don't have settled status. People who come during transition periods or people who've been here for some time, went out, came back, and have to prove that they were here before. It sounds nightmarish. We're not very good at bureaucracy. We don't know how many people we've got in this country. We haven't got a clue, but for a long period of time we weren't taking any notice of who was coming in, who was going out, and we've only done it for security reasons. So bureaucracy will increase, or will supposedly, as it is, we're having great difficulty coping with what we've got at present. Uh, and and the, there will be huge confusion as to where you belong. Who, who goes and registers? Who doesn't? How long have you been here? Can you prove anything? And if we're really seriously saying that the documentation is going to be very simple in the future, um, anything that, that differentiates people quite so much is not going to lead to, to uh, any uh, clarity at all. So. Um, Nevertheless, we have this transition period. It may last forever. And Jonathan Porters, who isn't here, uh, but I'm doing his little bit, has sent this little note to me about what the worst case and the best case scenario is. If I can just read that quickly, then we'll get into 
much into the time. So, the best case is that the withdrawal agreement is agreed in October. Uh, we have to do that because then everyone has to vote for it. And it's signed in March, okay, before we leave. So the Home Office puts in place new, much more user-friendly regi uh, registration system. Um, and very little uh, changes really for EU citizens here now. Now, of course, there isn't really any registration system except for non-EU. Uh, but there will be a registration system. It's not that difficult to do. And the transitional period means everything goes smoothly. Okay, this is his best case scenario. This is Jonathan dreaming right now. Uh, and the UK and the EU then negotiate a long-term deal which allows continued labour mobility, even if not free movement, after 2021, so that strong links continue. Now, of course, this is quite likely, frankly, because, you know, lots of people come in uh, freely uh, and then only really need a permit from non-EU when they start working. So what you can do to cut down the bureaucracy is you can pass all the work for it two firms, two organizations, which then have to apply for whatever visa it is that you've, you've, you, you, you need. And, and frankly, uh, it, it can be made quite simple if you want to and continue having this preferential hiring thing for EU people too. It's not beyond the, the, you know, pos the possibility that we could achieve. So, so that's, the, that's the best case scenario. So we end up more or less you know, with EU citizens as preferred citizens who come in easily and get jobs without us worrying about it, then you wonder why on earth do we do any of this mm. at all? Uh, the worst case is that talks break down. Uh, of course, it matters a lot in terms of people who come in, but it also matters hugely about the economy more generally, and the question then is, does anyone really want to come and work here, frankly? But anyway, by March 19, there is no signed withdrawal agreement. This doesn't mean EU citizens living here will be deported or lose their jobs, well, who knows? Um, that, but uh, Jonathan believes, and I think it's right, and it's a shame that Joe isn't here, that they will be protected because all the relevant directives form part of EU, UK law. And remember, we're bringing them all in to the UK law uh, structure. Um, that's the process of this. We are basically importing everything that we were doing under EU, and then we decide which ones to keep and which ones we won't. But there will be a sort of policy limbo if this is where to happen. And it would go on in a long time, and the political tension could be rising. And that actually is very, very uncertain for anybody uh, who is here. And the relationship with the EU is very bad, is the way he put it. Uh, actually, that's pretty constrained by, by Jonathan. Um, and EU citizens here would be caught in the crossfire. And it's for you guys to decide whether you want to be bothered staying in this place or not. Let's hope that Greece um, and its economy picks up very strongly in the meantime. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, I would like to open it up directly to questions from uh, the floor. We have a, a mic somewhere. Yes. Can we take a question? We'll start from the very front here. At the Okay, well, I'll, yeah. I'll start on the first one. Well, it's, it's interesting what's been going on, because, of course, the, the people who are in favor of Brexit have been using the, the fact that the economy has done reasonably well as a way of saying, well, see, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with Brexit, it's all going to be fine. But the truth is, of course, that we are growing here in the UK at, the, at a very slow pace, 
So 1.7 uh, last year. If indeed the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, is right, it will just be 1.5 percent this year, 1.3 percent next year, 1.3 percent. So this doesn't create any real sustainable growth profile for anyone. And and of course, with investment being low and so on, uh, that is that is an issue. But given that the world economy is is booming and we have uh, one of the highest uh, you know sharpest increases in world trade that we've had in ages um, uh, manufacturing has indeed benefited um, the, the the fall in the pound has helped um, but we should in theory be doing considerably better instead we are at the bottom of the league in terms of our competitors the, the bottom of G7 and if we believe the OECD we're at the bottom of the G20 in terms of growth um, now, at what point will it start affecting people individually? I mean, what's happened already is that the consumer is, is under real pressure because inflation has been rising and, uh, and wages have not uh, to the same extent. So disposable incomes have been declining for a number of quarters. Uh, there is already an understanding that, that things are uh, getting worse for individuals and, and real wages, as we know, have not increased since the crisis. Um, businesses are beginning to say, if we're going to be continuing to, to, to prosper, we need the customs union. So they're already putting pressure for that. So everyone, so the Labour Party is talking now about a customs union. I think with that type of, uh, the financial sector thinks they're going to get mutual recognition. They won't. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of push to do something to stay close to the single market. Uh, so I think it, it's the public opinion is changing s too slowly uh, for for the li for the remainers, uh, but it is changing, and businesses are finally putting a lot more pressure in terms of the type of of, of Brexit that that we need to have. Uh, so I think that 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 is going on uh, in a in a in a in a slow way, but finally they're they're waking up to what the implications of this is, and they're being they're being very. Uh, um, much more voluble than, than uh, well, that you can hear them a, lo a lot more than before. And if you open your newspapers, the partisan ones or any, it's now full of bad news about, about the economy, even though we're still growing, uh, about ret retail outlets closing down, about you know, the pressure in various areas. Yes, manufacturing doing well, but construction not doing so. House prices falling, uh, which is what's happening right now. So. You, you, it's beginning, I think, to filter through normal media a lot, lot more. I mean, if you can f find me a, a positive story of the last few weeks, that would be quite, quite useful since you're a, a journalist. So, over to you. Interesting question after what I said earlier about British pragmatism. I think <laughs> that uh, what may happen now in Europe might be beneficial for Greece. Um, President Macron's proposals are, in my mind, in the right direction in the way of governing um, the, the monetary union. Um, they will not all, all, all his uh, proposals, they won't come to fruition because Germany will not give in to that. But um, usually we would have said that Germany is the hard, um, the hard cop in the story. But this is a very different Germany now that they're forming this government. And that gives me hope. Um, First, that they will change their policies very much in terms of the very strict uh, austerity that they were demanding. And even if it doesn't change in effect because we're quite far into the, towards the end of the program, um, there still is debt relief and so on to be discussed. And there might be a new climate in that. But for me, the most important part is that we have this government in Germany. And it's a government that is more centrist than uh, German governments were in the past. The um, SPD came very much to the, towards the center. and and the CDU went very much towards the center so that they could meet. Um, and I think the most important thing that this government can offer right now is to show that a centrist government can still function. If it does function, I think for me the big, um, what, what's, at, what's, at, what's at play here is if, if they can be a good um, government for the Germans and, uh, and then play a, a positive role in the, in the European Union. So it's, it's Sad to say, but it's almost irrelevant whether Britain is there or not, because this is the big, uh, the big bet that's being played. And I think that the biggest danger right now comes from Italy, uh, which is too big to ignore anymore. I mean, I remember watching Italy's um, debt costs rising a few years ago, 
just after Greece, they, they, it became even, it reached the level that Greece had to ask for help, and it was just such a big problem that everybody said, there's no problem. It was too big to tackle. Now it's, now it's very big on, uh, at all levels. Um, so the, the French, um, German um, axis, if I could say that, will be tested very, very uh, severely now, and we'll see what comes out of that. Um, I don't know how the British would have helped if they were more vocal about that, and there are a whole lot of problems that the EU has had to face that were the result of British pressure to have that uh, kind of policy, whether it was the rapid enlargement without preparation, whether it was the very close relationship with Turkey, uh, was all these opting out and uh, keeping things um, separate. Those, those worked politically in, in, in Britain, but um, we saw the, the results on, uh, on the EU. And it was so interesting to see in the in the referendum debate, uh, the Turkey being the boogeyman. Whereas the, was the UK, Whereas was was the UK yeah. that had insisted that a relationship um, gets, you know, move in that direction very rapidly. I hope that answers your question. But the same with East, with East European workers, because we opened our doors mm -hmm. first yes. uh, and, and then complained. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to take pairs of questions, uh, if possible. Uh, but can, uh, can we start here? Can you pass the mic? We'll take a couple of questions and then you answer. I want to thank you very much for this presentation. We heard about uh, Brexit, but it didn't happen. And Brexit that almost has happened. Uh, firstly, there are two different, totally different issues. But the important issue about this is that Brexit did not happen because it would be an economic decision. Well, Brexit happened because it was an economic <laughs> decision. Uh, and we also heard a very interesting uh, and painful uh, comparison between Greece and, and, and the UK, although I think it was a bit unfair and unrelated because we were talking about two very different countries and two very different environments. But my question is the following, and I don't know who of the panelists can answer. Security has not come into the discussion seriously, and with the worsening uh, developments overall security, do you think that security would play a role now into changing the mindset of Brexit? Not necessarily reversing it, but thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, so, uh, can we take the gentleman at the fourth row behind? Yeah, and my question is um, for Chris Price. Um, I just um, want your opinion, really, what you think this transitional period will actually be until the end of 2019, 2020, or if it will actually, uh, when do you think it will actually get any longer? Okay, so we have a, a transition well, period, then the big question about okay, security. Well on, se on security, I mean, uh, the ambassador is absolutely right. Uh, this is now coming up on the agenda, and as we know already, uh, between the various speeches that Theresa May has made, at, in her first speech at Lancaster House, if I remember correctly, uh, she said that if the Europeans don't give us what we want, then we'll stop cooperating on security. By the time she did her Florence speech, she dropped that, like lots of other things as well. Um, and of course now, with everything that's happening, it's, you, know, you realize it even more how, you know, if you were to do anything, let's say, on the Russian issue, uh, working alongside the rest of Europe is going to be particularly significant. So, so we've already said that we will, co will continue to cooperate on security, assuming, of course, they have us. And, and of course, they would want that too, but it isn't going to be anything like as easy as it was before. Uh, so uh, uh, it, it is, I think, focusing, focusing, or at least one hopes that is focusing minds. Uh, but I, do, I have to say that I do still think that a lot of the members of the cabinet live in fantasy land in terms of what can be achieved because we are so significant and important and after all we have we have an, we, have, we we are a serious po power supposedly in terms of uh, um, sort of defense capabilities and what have you uh, and we have already nevertheless made some concessions too we we've, we've, we've agreed to to put more troops in in in, uh, in near in Estonia wherever it is Slovakia well, I can't remember now where these things are happening mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and and pledge to to also provide some more uh, equipment ourselves, military equipment for for various um, um, 
uh, efforts that are being made right now in terms of boosting the security of, of, of Europe. So we, we seem to be, uh, we're helping the French and uh, with, with uh, whatever it is, it isn't helicopters, whatever those planes are that, uh, that are needed in Africa. Um, uh, so, so we realize that actually we can't act on our own. We have to be part of, of, of this. And, and I do hope that it focuses minds. But as I said, I, I just fear a little bit that we still have a number of people who can't quite understand what these issues are uh, in, in, in the cabinet at present. I, I'm not suggesting for a minute that perhaps a change of government will make that any better. Uh, but I think between now and any withdrawal agreement, I think that the cooperation we need with Europe is going to probably... Uh, be quite an important uh, factor in shaping it. If I may add to, to the security, my understanding in Athens is that um, there's agreement that nothing will get in the way of very close security cooperation. That it's, it's, ir it's irrelevant uh, with regard to Brexit. Security in terms of terrorism and that kind of... Um, well, yes, but you do need quite a lot of those those uh, bodies to work together mm -hmm. and those various forces to work together. And and I'm not sure that they... Well, in order for that to happen, you also may need to be accepting some wider authority above. So uh, this is quite a... In terms of how things are moved around, uh, people and and and, uh, uh, and and the sort of intelligence that, that needs to circulate. So it would be quite interesting to see how it develops. On the economic side, uh, or a transition period... Um, uh, it depends how I wake up in the morning, really. Uh, <laughs> and if, I, if I've had a really good night's sleep, transition will last forever. And if not, then I'm very, very miserable. Um, I, I just seriously don't know. But I think the difficulty is when we get there. And I think actually security and other issues uh, are going to be quite important in this. Um, we might actually find uh, that, that uh, either transition lasts forever or we end up with something which is very, 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 very close to where we are now, but without exercising any control. So, by which I mean really uh, that we end up with uh, some sort of EEA membership, uh, which, uh, you know, you can't, you know, you could be, actually, even though they said there wouldn't be any more members of the EEA uh, after Norway. Um, but nevertheless, we could uh, practically be there. Uh, so uh, that that would probably be the best scenario if we're really leaving. The very very best scenario is a referendum uh, on on the actual uh, deal, which will go our way. <laughs> we see. Mm. Okay, another round of questions. The lady here. Mm -hmm. They can't go home. And what kind of jobs do 
there, there's another question behind you, I think. Yeah. Can we take one question at the very back as well, so and then we answer all three questions, if possible? Uh, the gentleman at the very back. Yes. Um, my experience um, as an English person brought up um, in Greek family in London is that what we're now seeing is a kind of reversal in um, people with Greek spouses wanting to apply for Greek passports for their children and, and English citizens wanting Greek passports. That, that's been my experience. Um, can you comment on that trend, if that is your experience? <laughs> okay, Nico, would you like to take first any of the questions? And so uh, uh, yes, uh, one by one or uh, one at a time? If you, if you want to choose, well, I, 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 yeah, you don't have to answer all I'd like to start with the um, the young Greeks in post-Brexit Britain, I don't know. I don't know what, uh, I don't think they know. I can't have any opinion on that. It depends on what the um, outcome of the of the talks will be. But what I, I do want to note, and I, I wish I had the figure with me, uh, trust me, in a poll um, that was held on why Greeks are leaving, young Greeks are leaving Greece, the top uh, answer was because there's no meritocracy in Greece. They don't trust the system there. And that's now. This is after eight years of crisis and ostensibly we were going to work to fix things. They have no faith in the system there, so they will, they will try this as far as it can go. Uh, that's how I feel and that's how I feel that my children see that too. They have no uh, qualms about leaving Greece to, to, to do better elsewhere. Um, it's a very big problem, I, I feel, and I, I come to the second question on that, that it's psychologically, it's very, very damaging, this thing that is happening, this uh, schism that uh, has, has come into society. We, we've lived through, through that since the beginning of, uh, of Greece. We said, uh, you know, four wars, four civil wars, and uh, seven bankruptcies. They don't happen by chance. Uh, there's a... Um, incendiary political climate all the time. And when the outside factors contribute to that, then it, it div the society divides very badly. If they don't have uh, outside factors, then the division in itself is very damaging to each individual. And I think uh, you'll be seeing a, a, a lot more of this kind of tension coming out because when arguments are failing, they become more extreme. And at present, I think everybody's arguments are failing. The, pr the, the pragmatism that we mentioned, of course, I, 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 I had um, sort of said under the surface that I, I don't believe that it's there anymore. And uh, the comments that I said at the end that what the, the, um, the, the, the British should uh, try to avoid is things that they're already doing. Um, it was kind of a double irony there. If I, if I was misunderstood, I'm sorry. Um, so people are not told the, the, the consequences of the political decisions that they take, ever, anywhere. Were the Americans warned about Trump, other than uh, Trump being himself a, a flashing light? Uh, I don't think that everybody who voted for him wanted what they got. 
uh, at the end. And I think that's a problem in our politics generally. And I think that's why we have, if, if I may, I'm going completely off the topic here. I think the reason why we have such ideological problems is because we don't have ideological um, relationship with, uh, with, with public life. The people are not taught uh, these things. They should be taught these things at school just as they taught everything else. I see that having raised three children, that it was very valuable that uh, they have a grounding in, in the consequences of actions and uh, the psychological fallout from uh, what, what, what is done, either at the very large group level or in the home or in their relationships. Um, so yes, I think the danger is very big from the um, tensions uh, that come from division. Yeah. Okay, can I just, um, can I just add? Um, uh, the Greeks, the young Greeks, very good question. Of course, the young Greeks have the opportunity to go anywhere in Europe, which is not going to be the case for the young Brits uh, under the worst case scenario of Jonathan Porter. So consider themselves lucky. They, sh they should do, actually. Um, in terms of people wanting to uh, become Greeks, but that's for the same reason. And of course, it's not just Greeks. People want to be, you know, loads of people are digging up the, 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 the death certificates of their grandmothers in Ireland. And of course, there are loads and loads and loads of them. I think Ireland's, uh, the, the embassies are inundated <laughs> completely with requests, and hopefully they charge a reasonable amount and uh, make up, you know, for, you know, Greece should actually do rather yeah. well out of this, I hope. Um, you know, we're all Greeks now, which I think would be fantastic if this was the case, That's and make, make some money out of that. Um, so, um, in terms of the economics, uh, the truth is that the people were told, and they were not believed. Uh, sorry, the people who said it, that things were going to be difficult and that the economy wasn't going to do well, um, uh, were, were uh, dismissed as experts who know nothing. Uh, in fact, one of the cabinet ministers said, uh, we have enough of experts who believe anything they say. And the trouble is that even now, uh, when the, the civil service has produced reports showing the problems in various sectors uh, and various regions as a result of Brexit, they were kept hidden, and in fact, the person in charge who had commissioned the work, uh, cabinet minister in charge of leaving the EU, uh, said, I don't believe in any modeling that people do, economic modeling, and therefore, it's no point in even having these impact assessments published. Uh, they have finally published them with lots of things taken out. Uh, so in an environment like that, it really is what the ambassador was saying earlier. Um, People have voted despite the economics, or, or, or not worrying, or not believing, perhaps, I'm not sure, um, that there would be any economic problems. Uh, and voting more on the migration side, nostalgia, a blue passport, I don't know, uh, so taking a new passport rather than the European Union one. Um, so it was not done with logic, but it was done from the heart for those who voted to, get to leave. Uh, and that's a very difficult one to fight against, however much uh, evidence you can produce and really goes back to the question asked earlier which is that you know it takes a lot of time to change someone's view if they voted from the heart rather than with their brains uh, and that's the problem we may have I don't remember there was another question yeah. was that it? No, no, that was it. Uh, also the you know what the, the, the young Greeks but I think the you answered that yes the young Greeks are young so it's uh, fine um, I'm afraid we have run out of time, so we'll need to bring it to, to a close. I've been advised to give a closing summary, and I know my closing summary is standing between the, the wine reception uh, and you, uh, so I'll try to keep it uh, very, very uh, short. Um, I'm inspired by the, the question about the experts, so I will, I will uh, start uh, from there. The experts have given the warnings, both in relation to Brexit, also in relation to the, uh, the Greek bailouts, uh, but they have been systematically discredited. And then this, uh, and also in the US, in relation to, to uh, the policies by the current uh, president there. Uh, and this opens up the wider question of the disconnect, if you want, between uh, public attitudes, beliefs, sentiments, uh, allegiances, and if you want, the global economy, or where the world's the world order was going uh, until a few years uh, back. So people feel more connected to their historical memories. Uh, you know, it's not just the, the blue passport uh, for Britain, it's also what a great empire we, we were, 
before we joined the European Union. So it's this kind of, you know, I don't know if it's nostalgia or some uh, uh, innate uh, need to connect to something uh, historical, and I think the same can be applied also to the Rust Belt in the US, uh, parts of France, uh, even in Greece. I think, you know, one can develop uh, uh, this argument. On the other hand, you have something which is increasingly complex, increasingly complex also for the experts to analyze, and that's why you also have experts who, who come up, ha come forward with different predictions and disagreements. I mean, experts always disagree, but uh, especially uh, nowadays. <laughs> So I think then, given this disconnect and given this challenging uh, environment, uh, in some way you can, you can think of Brexit as a particular event that happened in the UK or in the European Union and, and, and try to, uh, to, to understand what are the implications of that as we have been doing uh, today. Or in some other way you can see it just as one of the many uh, expressions of a wider uh, s global social problem of this kind of, of disconnect. And I think the implications of these things um, uh, are similar. I would like to end with a very, very uh, optimistic to the point of naivety uh, uh, kind of assertion that uh, in the grand scheme of things, Brexit will do very little uh, to most people in Europe, in Britain, uh, and in the world. Britain will still have trade relations, political relations, security, uh, cooperation with most of Europe as it did also before 1973 uh, and also through other venues, G20, NATO, uh, uh, anything. Uh, people will still be able to travel and to occasionally get jobs uh, outside Britain and in Britain as they do now also. You know, there's people from uh, Brazil who work in Britain uh, if you go to Brazil, you will find some Britons or to Argentina even. Uh, so, you know, we're not, in a, we're not returning to a world where, uh, you know, big walls are erected and people cannot move and uh, we're going to have uh, an autarkic uh, environment like how Albania was uh, a few decades back. Uh, Britain is still going to be open, Europe is going to be open, technology enables mobility, people's attitudes uh, enable mobility, despite what I said <laughs> just a minute ago. So I think in the grand, grand scheme of things, uh, things will not be so devastating as one uh, may, may put down on paper in a theoretical exercise, uh, even if the transition period doesn't last forever, as Joe uh, uh, put forward. So I would like to keep this thought just in, uh, you know, to, to, to put a smile in faces while we're having a, a glass of wine. We can discuss more things over the reception, if possible. In the reception time, yeah. Okay. Uh, before you leave and, and uh, set a glass of wine, thank you very much, thank you very much. Uh, would like to, to give the floor to the president. Thank you. Please, before you go, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Gosh, how nice. Thank you very much. Ah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>